Good morning, Jaguar Nation, and welcome to our 2021 Black Christian Month celebration. My name is Kevion Patterson, and I have the honor of serving as your Master of Ceremony. Today, we will be sharing some historical facts and stories about some of the pioneers in African American history. We will hear some familiar names, but we will also visit some histories forgotten heroes. We will even dive into some local black history. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our Black History Month celebration. First, we have Desmond Mitchell with our first local legend. Did you know that our school was named after a Memphis legend? Antonio Maceo Walker, who simply called Maceo by his family, was born on June 7, 1909 in Indiola, Mississippi. His father, Joseph Edison Walker, was a medical doctor and entrepreneur. When Maceo was 13 years old, his family moved to Memphis where he attended Lamone High School. In 1930, he graduated from Fisk University with a bachelor's degree in business administration. He then attended New York University where he earned his MBA or master's in business administration. After receiving his master's from NYU, he then attended the University of Michigan where he earned his second master's degree, this time in actuarial science, which is important in the fi finance industry. At the time of his graduation in 1935, Maceo was the only black actor in the state of Tennessee. During the summers between his studies, Maceo sold insurance for the Universal Life Insurance Company in Memphis, which was founded by his father and associates in 1923. After graduate school, Maceo joined the company's audit department full time. In 1935, he was elected to the board of directors. The Walkers saw the need for a black owned bank to provide re resources and loans for other black owned businesses in the area that otherwise were denied by all other banks. So in 1946, Maceo and his father opened the Tri-State Bank and Trust Company the first black owned bank in Memphis. Today, it is simply known as the Tri-State Bank of Memphis and is located at the corner of Elvis Presley Boulevard and Shelby Drive in, 19, in 1952, Walker became president of the Universal Life Insurance Company. Upon his father's death in 1958, Maceo also became president of Tri-State Bank. On June 8, 1994, the day after his 85th birthday, Antonio Maceo Walker passed away here in Memphis. In the fall of 2002, the former Memphis City Schools District honored Mr. Walker by opening A. Maceo Walker Middle School. Mr. Walker joined the likes of other historical black figures to have schools in Memphis named in his honor, along with Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, Frederick Douglass, Lucy C. Campbell, and Robert R. Church, among others. Today, we celebrate our school being the namesake of a true pioneer of Memphis, Mr. Antonio Maceo Walker. Thanks, Desmond. It was, it's amazing that our school was named after such a prestigious man. Next, we have Antonio Blair, who will be exploring ancient Egypt, followed by poems by our very own Jesse Jacks. Hello everyone, I am Antonio Blair, a student from my Michelle Walker Middle School, and I'll be telling you about ancient Egypt and Monsa Musa. Many think black history started on slavery, but that's false. Once upon a time, we were kings and queens. You may know about the youngest person to ever rule, which is King Tut. King Tut ruled as a pharaoh of Egypt for 10 years, starting at the age of 9 and ending at his death at 19. His father, Akkadon, was the king before him. Genetically testing has verified that King Tut was the grandson of the great pharaoh Hitmotep III. King Tut's tomb is also a major part of history as he was buried with many jewels. Monsu, the 14th century, the 14th century African empire remains the richest person in history. Monsu became the ruler 
of Mala Empire in 1312. During that period, the Mala Empire flourished thanks to the ample nature resources like gold and salt. Mansa Musa inherited a kingdom that was already wealthy, but his work in expanding trade made Mala the wealthiest kingdom in Africa. His riches came from mining significant salt and gold deposits in the Mala Kingdom. Elephant ivory was another major source of wealth. Mansa Musa had a total of 400 to 415 billion dollars in modern day money. Great job, Antonio. Once again, outstanding performance by our own Jazzy Jags. Next, we will learn about one of our most 
prominent abolitionist in history, Frederick Douglass. Here to present, we have Ayanna Sales and Jocelyn Johnson. Frederick Douglass was born into slavery in or around 1818 <coughs> in Tower County, Maryland. Douglass himself was never sure of his exact birth date. His mother was a Native American ancestor. His father was of African and European descent. He was actually born Frederick Bailey and took the name Douglass only after he escaped. His full name at birth was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Frederick Douglass was an escaped slave who became a permanent activist, author, and public speaker. He became a leader in the abolitionist movement, which saw to end the practice of slavery during and before and during the Civil War. After that conflict and the Emancipation Proclamation of 1826, he continued to push for equality and human rights until his death in 1895. After he was separated from his mother as an infant, Douglas lived for a time with his maternal grandmother, Betty Bailey. However, at the age of six, he was moved away from her to live and work on the White House Plantation in Maryland. From there, Douglas was given to Lacrida All, whose husband Thomas sent him to work with his brother Hugh in Baltimore. Douglas credits Hugh's wife, Ah, Sophia, with teaching, with first teaching him the alphabet. From there, he taught himself to read and write. By the time he was hired out to work under William Freeland, he was teaching other enslaved people to read using the Bible. As word spread of his efforts to educate fellow enslaved people, Thomas All took him back and transferred him to Edward Convey, a farmer who was known for his brutal treatment of the enslaved people in his charge. Roughly 16 at this time, Douglas was regularly whooped by Convey. After several failed attempts at escaping, Douglas finally left Convey's farm in 1838. First boarding a train to Henry D. Grace, Maryland. From there, he traveled through Delaware, another slave state, before arriving in New York in the safe house of abolitionist David Ruggles. Once settled in New York, he sent for Anna Murray, a free black woman from Baltimore he met while in captivity with the Alls. She joined him and the two were married in September 1838. They would have five children together. After their marriage, the young couple moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they met Nathan and Mary Johnson, a married couple who were born free persons of color. It was Douglas after. It was the Johnsons who inspired the couple to take the surname Douglas after the character in a Sir Walter Scott poem, The Legends of the Lake. In New Bedford, Douglas began attending meetings of the abolitionist movement. During these meetings, he was exposed to the writing of abolitionists and the journalist William Will Garrison. The two men eventually met when both were asked to speak at an abolitionist meeting during which Douglas shared his story of slavery and escape. It was Garrison who encouraged Douglas to become a speaker and leader in the abolitionist movement. By 1843, Douglas had become a part of the American Anti-Slavery Society, hundreds of conventions, projects, a six-month tour to the United States. Douglas was physically assaulted several times during the tour by those opposed to the abolitionist movement. In one particular brutal attack in Pendleton, Indiana, Douglas' hand was broken. The injuries never fully healed and never regained full use of his hand. During the brutal conflict that divided the still young United States, Douglas continued to speak and work tirelessly for the end of slavery and the right of newlywed free black Americans to vote. Although he supported President Abraham Lincoln in the early years of the Civil War, Douglas would have fallen into disagreement with the politicians after the 
Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, which effectively ended practice of slavery. Douglas was disappointed that Lincoln did not use the proclamation to grant formerly enslaved people the right to vote, particularly after they had fought bravely alongside soldiers for the Union Army. It is said, though, that Douglas and Lincoln later reconciled and following the latter's assassination in 1865 in the passage of the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which received outlawed slavery, granted formerly enslaved people citizenship and equal protection under law and protected all citizens from racial disagreement in voting. Douglas was asked to speak at the dedication of Emancipation Proclamation Memorial in Washington, D.C., Lincoln Park in 1876. In 1877, Douglas met with Thomas Auld, the man who once owed him. The two reportedly reconciled. Douglas' wife Anna died in 1882, and he married white activist Helen Pitts in 1884. In 1888, he became the first African American to receive a vote for President of the United States during the Revocation National Convention. Ultimately, though, Benjamin Harris received the party nomination. Douglas remained an active speaker, writer, and activist until his death in 1895. He died after suffering a heart attack on his way home from a meeting at the National Council of Women, a woman's right group still in infancy at the time in Washington, D.C. Excellent job, ladies. Now here to share with us about the Hall of Renaissance, we have Corday Bill. Greetings, everyone. I'm Corday Bell, representing Team Challengers Home Room 85. Welcome to our Black History program. Our Black heritage is rich and fascinating in so many ways. For instance, the Harlem Renaissance. In the 1920s, creative and intellectual life flourished within African American communities in the North and Midwest regions of the United States, but nowhere more so than in Harlem. The New York City neighborhoods encompassing only three square miles teamed with black artists, intellectuals, writers, and musicians. Black owned businesses from newspapers, publishing houses, and music companies to nightclubs, cabarets, and theaters helped fuel the neighborhood's thriving scene. Some of the era's most important literary and artistic, fi artistic figures migrated to or passed through the Negro capital of the world helping to define a period in which African-American artists reclaimed their identity and racial pride and defiance of widespread prejudice and discrimination, one being the famous African writer Langston Hughes. Here to read one of his most famous poems are my classmates Samara Brownlee and Markyla Williams. Greetings everyone, my name is Shamara Brownlee. And I have the honor of reading a poem by Langston Hughes. I hope you enjoy it. The Negro Mother. Children, I come back today to tell you a story of the long dark way that I had to climb that I had to know in order that the race might live and go. Look at my face back at the night, yet shining like the sun with love true light. I am the child they stole from the sand 300 years ago in Africa's land. I am the dark girl who crossed the white sea, carrying in my body the seed of the free. But I'm the woman who worked in the field, bringing the cotton and the corn to you. I am the one who labored as a slave, beaten and mistreated for the work I gave. No safe children sold away from me, as this all too. No safety, no love, no respect was I do. We need to use in the deepest south, but God put a song and a prayer in my mouth. God put a dream, like still in my soul. Not be my children, I'm reaching the goal. Not be my children, young and free, I realized the blessings due to me. I couldn't read them, I couldn't write, I had nothing back there in the night. Sometimes the valley was filled with tears, but I kept treasuring on through the lonely years. Sometimes the road was hot with the sun, but I had to keep on till my work was done. I had to keep on, no stopping for me. 
I was the seed for the coming free. I nourished the dream that nothing could smother deep in my destiny for mother. I had only hope then, but not through you. Thousands of today, my dreams must come true. All you dark children in the world out there, remember my sweat, my pain, my despair. Remember my years heavy with sorrow, and make of those years a torch for tomorrow. Make of my past a road to the light, out of the darkness, the ignorance, the night. Look high my banner out of the dust, stand like free men supporting my trust. Believe in the light, let men push you back. Remember the whip and the slavers track. Remember how the strong in struggle and strife will buy you the way and deny you life. But my travel forward, break down bars, look ever upward at the sun and the stars. Oh, my dark children, may my dreams and my prayers until you forever up the great stairs. But I will be with you till no white brother. There are two down the children of the Negro mother. Wow, that was powerful. Outstanding job, eighth graders. Now here to tell us about the original of the civil rights movement. I present to you, Jamaya Watson. Plessy versus Ferguson was a landmark 1896 U.S. Supreme Court decision that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation under the separate but equal doctrine. The case stemmed from an 1892 incident in which African-American train passenger Homer Plessy refused to sit in a car for black people. Rejecting Plessy's argument that his constitutional rights were violated, the Supreme Court ruled that a law that implies merely a legal distinction between white people and black people was not unconstitutional. As a result, restrictive Jim Crow legislation and separate public accommodations based on race became commonplace. After the Compromise of 1877 led to the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, Democrats consolidated control of state legislators throughout the region, effectively marking the end, re end of Reconstruction. Southern Black people saw the promise of equality under the law embodied by the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, and 15th Amendment to the Constitution receding quickly and a return of disenfranchisement and other disadvantages of, as white supremacy reasserted itself across the South. As Southern Black people witnessed with horror the dawn of the Jim Crow era, members of the Black community in New Orleans decided to mount a resistance. At the heart of the case that became Plessy v. Ferguson was a law passed in Louisiana in 1890 providing for the separate railway carriages for the white and colored races. It stipulated that all passenger railways had to provide these separate cars which should be equal in facilities. Homer Adolph Plessy, who agreed to be the plaintiff in the case, aimed at testing the law's constitutionality was, mix, was a mixed race. He described himself as seventh eighth Caucasian and one eighth African blood. On June 7, 1892, Plessy bought a ticket on a train from New Orleans bound for Covington, Louisiana, and took a vacant seat in a whites only car. After refusing to leave the car at a conductor's insistence, he was arrested and jailed. Convicted by a New Orleans court of violating the 1890 law, Plessy filed a petition against the presiding judge, John H. Ferguson, claiming that the law violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. In 1955, a black woman refused to yield her seat to a white person on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. She was removed from the bus and arrested. Her ordeal sparking legal action that led to the end of Alabama segregated bus laws and enabled a widespread civil rights movement to pick up steam. You may think you know the story, but this one isn't about Rosa Parks. It's about Claudette Colvin, a 15 year old who made a stand against entrenched segregation nine months before Ro Rosa Parks did, but saw her shining moment eclipsed as other narratives of the era took root in the public consciousness. On March 2nd, Colvin was riding the bus home from school when a familiar order came from the bus driver to vacate a row of seats to accommodate a white woman. Three of her classmates got up, but Colvin didn't budge, informing the two officers who soon boarded that she knew her constitutional rights. They responded by roughly yanking the teen off the bus and handcuffing her in the back of the squad car, subjecting her to lewd comments as they made their way to the city jail. Colvin's plight caught the attention of local black leaders who helped secure the legal representation that led to most of the charges being dropped. The leaders considered using her example 
simple as justification for a citywide bus boycott, but something wasn't right. She was too young and emotional to serve as the rallying figure for what was certain to be a turbulent movement. When it was revealed that Coven had been impregnated by an older man later that summer, it seemingly confirmed that sentiment that she was the wrong person for the movement. The right person arrived when, when Parks, a 42-year-old seamstress and NAACP secretary, made headlines for her arrest on December 1st, prompting the launch of the Montgomery bus boycott the following day. Wow, Jamaya, that is so interesting. Not many people know about Claudette Colvin. Thank you for sharing. Next, we will have Angelia Woods sharing the case of Brown versus the Board of Education Tupica and the subsequent actions that followed. Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka was a landmark 1954 Supreme Court case in which the justices ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools were unconstitutional. Brown versus the Board of Education was, a, was one of the cornerstones of the civil rights movement and helped establish the precedent that separate but equal education and other services were not in fact equal at all. When, the case, when Brown's case and four other cases related to school segregation first came before the Supreme Court in 1952, the court combined them into a seasonal case, seasonal case under the name Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. In the decision issued on May 17, 1954, Warren wrote that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place as segregated schools are inherently unequal. As a result, the court ruled that the plaintiffs were being deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. Little Rock Nine were a group of black students who enrolled at formerly all-white Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in September 1957. Their attendance at the school were Tess Brown versus the Board of Education, a landmark 1954 Supreme Court ruling that declared segregation in the public schools unconstitutional. On September 4, 1957, the school of the first day of classes at Central High, Governor Orville Feathers called in Arkansas National Guard to block the black students' entry into the high school. Later that month, President Dwight D. Eisenhower sent the federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into the school. It drew national attention to the civil rights movement. The first intuitions to integrate would be the high schools, beginning in September 1957. Among these was Little Rock Central High School, which opened in 1927 and was originally called Little Rock Senior High School. Two pro-segregation groups formed to oppose the plan, the Capital Citizens Council and the Mother's League of Central High School. Thanks, Angelia. It's amazing to think that it really wasn't that long ago that black students literally had to fight just to go to sub-table schools. Wow. Next, I would like to introduce Rashad Jones to tell us about the Black Panther, followed by a spoken word. The Black Panther Party was founded in 1966 by Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, and Elbert Howard. The purpose of this movement was based on the development of nationalist sentiment. The leaders were Huey P. Newton, Bobby Seale, Elaine Brown, Stokely Carmichael, and Eldridge Cleaver. The movement was established for self-defense and to monitor police brutality in African-American communities. As time went on, they started to focus on social activism such as health clinics. I think the movement will fall in line as social, economic, and geographic. They were a social factor because it was a concern with the police brutality and values and safety of black people. They also cared about the economic factor because they wanted health care and better living conditions for black people. Also geographic because they tried to monitor black communities because they knew police brutality was big in that specific area. The party reached their peak in 1970. They started social movements such as Freedom by Any Means Necessary, adopted from Malcolm X and Power to the People. The party took a major influence on current movement Black Lives Matter. The FBI saw the party as enemies of the U.S. government and wanted to dismantle them. The FBI used its counterintelligence program used to provocators, sabotage, misinformation, and lethal force. The FBI had main leaders 
of the party on the most wanted, arrested, and killed. In 19, in December of 1969, a police raid in Chicago resulted in the death of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton. Many people didn't agree with this movement, but some did. This increased the support of the group among African Americans and the broad political left who both valued the Panthers as a powerful force opposed to de facto segregation and the military draft. The Black Panther Party wanted to also enlighten people on the rights as citizens of America. Invictus by William Ernest Henley Out of the night that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have no winch nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears, looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged upon his mr scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. That was absolutely powerful, Rashard. Outstanding job. And now to present Black History in the White House, I would like to reintroduce Jamaria Watson. Black History in the White House. Shirley Chisholm was an educator, author, and American politician. In 1968, she became the first Black woman elected to the U.S. Congress, where she represented New York's 12th Congressional District for seven terms from 1969 to 1983. In 1972 U.S. presidential election, Ms. Chisholm became the first African-American candidate, male or female, for a major party's nomination and the first woman, black or white, to run for the Democratic Party's presidential nomination. In November of 2005, Ms. Chisholm was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by a 44th U.S. president. More on him in just a second. Ms. Chisholm paved the way for nearly 20 African-American politicians to run their own presidential campaigns as third party candidates, but it wouldn't be until the 2008 election that another African American was able to win a major party's nomination. That individual was Barack Obama, who became the Democratic Party's nominee for the office of president. Mr. Obama began his political career as an Illinois state senator from 1997 to 2004. He then moved on to become a U.S. senator representing his home state of Illinois from 2005 to 2008. Mr. Obama quickly became a rising star in the Democratic Party and won the party's nomination for the 2008 presidential election. Thanks to what was then a record voter turnout, Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States and the very first African-American president serving two terms from 2009 to 2017. President Obama's campaign slogan was Change We Can Believe In and one of the most iconic symbols of his hope one of the most iconic symbols of his campaign was the Hope poster. President Obama's accomplishments and Ms. Chisholm's trailblazing opened the doors for our most recently written chapter in African American history. On January 21st, 2021, Kamala Harris was sworn in as the 49th Vice President of the United States. In doing so, she became the first African American VP, the first female VP, and the highest ranking female official in American history. Vice President Harris is a graduate of Howard University, a historically black university. She began her career in the Alameda County District Attorney's Office as a prosecutor before being recruited to the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and later the City Attorney of San Francisco's Office. She started her political career by being elected as the District Attorney for the City of San Francisco in 2003. She then became the Attorney General for the State of California from 2009 to 2000. 2017. Similar to President Obama in 2017, Vice President Harris won a seat on the U.S. Senate representing her home state of California and quickly became a star in the Democratic Party. She was selected by Joe Biden as his running mate for the 2020 U.S. presidential election and after another record-setting voter turnout, the rest is history, Black history that is. And now with the special presentation, I, I introduce to you a man who truly needs no introduction, our very own living legend, Coach Jimmy Taylor. Thank <laughs> you. 
Close title. Coach Taylor, you're on mute. Good morning. I have been given the task of talking about contributions from black women. We all know this is the year of the black woman. Women have rightfully began to be recognized for their contributions. Black women have been the bedrock and saving grace of our community and always have been phenomenal. Look around. There has been many black women that have ascended to leadership roles, namely Kamala Harris, the Vice President of the United States, to our very own administrative staff. Leslie Banks, Patricia Herbert, all were promoted to assistant principal. Our instructional leader, Ms. Tom Ford, our counselors, Lysandra Nevels and Ms. Tasha Spears, also in finances, Ms. Kimberly Wooden. After reading the book titled, The Last of the Nice Black Girls, I thought about a woman who was raised by her church going grandmother and her military father, who instilled in her structure and discipline. These are the very ingredients that it takes to be successful. Born in Chicago, her mother died when she was six years old. Her father brought her to Memphis to be raised by her grandmother. Today, I would like to share with you a woman who has persevered during hard times, and in my opinion, she's a hometown hero. She is the very first female coach of an all-boys football team. Her legacy of helping groom young men is astonishing. Shirley McRae book is an inspiring story. She coached at Chickasaw Junior High School, Lanier Junior High School, and also Booger T. Washington. Her mantra was instilled in her by her grandmother, which resonated. Girl, be somebody. Love God, always put him first, and your blessings will be added. Those words became etched in her heart, and she was determined to be somebody. She coached and mentored several outstanding young men, to name a few, and we all know Larry Finch, the star basketball player and coach at Memphis State University. Our very own Nathan Cole, the head football coach at Westwood, and now currently he holds that position at Mitchell High. Cheyenne Gibson, he went on to be a professional basketball player and also a coach at Sheffield High School. And we all know our beloved Baskerville Holmes, who was a star athlete and basketball player at Memphis State University. I always thought it was important that we let children know, even if you don't succeed in sports, we would admire you just being a productive citizen in this community. And Shirley McCree Cray has an impressive list of former players and athletes who have gone on to be outstanding. To name a few, Vincent Aldred, he's a prominent lawyer here in Memphis. Darian Sharp, the senior analyst, analyst for FedEx Corporation. Reverend Michael Deere, he's a minister. Reverend Terrence Trent, also a minister. Eric Russian, He's an electrical engineer with the FedEx Corporation. Miss Linda Lunton, she's a 
a corporate attorney with Mo Motorola Corporation. I met Shirley naturally on the football field. She had learned about the success of the Whitehaven Cowboys, which was one of the premier teams in the city of Memphis. This is a football team that I established in 1984. She wanted her team to emulate the values and attract some of the talented players that we had. Shirley really liked our motto, which was why not be the best? And our creed was nobody can stop us. So my hat's off to another strong black woman. Please join me today in saluting a strong black woman, Shirley McCray. Thanks. Thanks, Coach Jimmy, for sharing your knowledge on another truly true local legend. Again, my name is Kevion Patterson, and it has been my pleasure sharing as your MC today. Hope you enjoyed our presentation, but before I go, we have one more special treat in store, Miss Nevels. Good morning to Courtney Richardson, our parents, family, adopters, faculty, and staff. We, the A. Maceo Walker family, would like to thank you for your continued support at our annual Black History Program. It is in the spirit of the meaning that Black history carries that we celebrate all of the accomplishments that have propelled us to the great status we enjoy today. We hope you enjoyed the presentations that these students have poured their hearts into learning. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. We truly appreciate you and the support you give. I would be remiss if I didn't thank my great administrative team, Coach Jimmy Taylor and our amazing Dean of Students, Dean Robertson. Again, thanks to everyone for all your continued support.